This week we take a drive down Tokyo Highway, wheel and deal our wares in Yokohama, scrape up our brain after battling for feudums, and flip each other off as we take the last escape pod. This and much more in our inaugural episode of Rolling Devils Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Rolling Doubles, a podcast about two board game enthusiasts who have never met and rolled the dice on friendship. I'm the Jacobiest of all Jacobs, Jacob Russell. And I yell when I get excited, Ryan Schneider. How's it going? <laughs> good, good. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing wonderful. <laughs> okay, this is the... So, I'll talk about why we're doing this and and what exactly we're doing. So, we have actually never met in person. Never. We've met online a couple times we've done a, a test episode or two of this but we have never met and all the only thing we know about each other mainly is that we're both unhealthily obsessed about board games would you say unhealthily is that accurate on your end yeah i would say so it's a balance i mean it's i'm on this journey of like my hobby in this and it's it's definitely been more obsessive at times i think i'm in a safe spot now but it's not 100 percent safe I'm yeah. I'm coming off of uh, I'm coming off acquisitions disorder mountain like just sliding down like 2017 oh, yeah. was like climbing uh, the peak and now I'm just kind of sliding down. It's it's like not not like a, a huge angle, but I'm definitely kind of on the downslope in terms of uh, feeling like I need to own every single awesome game that's out there. That's for sure. Well, and what's weird is I feel like as I as I come off that as well, I feel myself go up again. Like maybe every six months or a year, it's bad. It goes and awesome. Yeah, it goes back and forth. A friend of mine uh, was super into Destiny and basically kind of stopped playing board games, and now he's kind of back on the board way, board game wagon, which is really awesome. Um, but yeah, it just kind of waxes and wanes, and right now I'm kind of waning, which is okay. I think it's healthy. Um, oh yeah. We'll see how this uh, you know this month and this year brings. Uh, with Gen Con Origins on the pipe, uh, there's going to be a lot of great stuff announcing and going to be releasing. So who knows? It could be on the upswing. I'm not sure. Do you? It's, I, I'm I'm excited though. That's all that it's, matters. That's true. That's true. It's a very exciting time in this hobby, and you see growth just all over the place. And so I've been in the hobby since maybe about 2011, 2012, and just since then it's just like skyrocketed from there it's been a very exciting time yeah and i would say almost i was going to say 2011 as well too i want to say maybe 2010 is when i was first introduced to some of my first heavier board games um we're talking like arkham horror we're talking uh descent those types of games the kind of the fantasy flight games those were kind of the big main popular games when you'd go to you know flgs's which is our uh friendly local gaming stores um those are the games i saw on the shelves and really didn't pay much attention to anything else and then from there i just kept getting introduced to game after game after game and as you said i just kind of started climbing this mountain and here we are yeah yeah same here i think it was 2008 when i first played settlers of Catan and carcassonne which my wife uh introduced me to uh and i and i love those games and i never really dove into it then at some for some reason I, i'm not really sure it wasn't until about 2012 when someone actually gave me ascension the deck building game as a gift and my eyes were completely opened and the obsession hit whole hog whole hog to the point where my wife was very concerned and it was a glorious glorious time that game has some great artwork and i think that's probably what pulled you in because like that that artwork and the easiness of that deck builder is really really nice Oh, yeah. It was super accessible. Well, I remember getting this. I was like, wait, there's games like this? I don't even know that games like this existed. And then I was, like, searching for it, and I landed on on a Board Game Geek, and that's when it went wild. And then I saw that site, and it's it's been that ever since. Yep. Oh, yes. Oh. Speaking of games, we should probably talk about some, yes. We should, yes. So this this overall format, though, is it's it's fluid. Uh, we'll see what works, what doesn't work. We're going to talk about games. We're going to learn more about each other through through this hobby uh, and see how it goes. We do not live next to each other. We are many, many states away. And ultimately, this is just for us. So if, if you don't like it, that's kind of on you because we're just going to do what we want for now and hope other people like it. Is that a bad philosophy? No. If, if people aren't interested, that's cool. You know, you there's a ton of different 
great podcasts out there. And we hope that you find us to be two cool dudes that you would want to like play games with if you ever saw us at like a convention or something. Just be able to sit down, chill out, hang out, play some games. Uh, if we are able to kind of fit in that mold, awesome. If not, that's all right. That's no problem. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But one thing I always want to do is definitely talk about, like you were saying, the games we've played. So what have you been playing? So I want to preface my first game by saying that I had taken a vacation to a country that I've wanted to go to since I was in high school. Um, Then that country is Japan. Uh, I went with two weeks with my wife uh, in the end of April, and I must say to you, like, there's a lot to say in, like, two weeks of travel and what is hopefully going to be about a minute, but it was a wonderful, wonderful time. All the people there that we met and stayed with were really nice. The food is excellent, Um, and there was a game that I picked up from there that I'm going to talk about called Tokyo Highway that is kind of regarded as, like, a a gem, a little, a little dexterity gem, uh, that I was able to find at a, uh, fairly well-known, I think one of the more established board games, uh, shops within Japan. I know there are multiple outlets that I had looked up, um, called Yellow Submarine. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tokyo Highway. So Tokyo Highway is published by Iten or Iten Games, I-T-T-E-N. Uh, designers are Naotaka Shimamoto uh, and designer and illustrator of Yoshiaki Tomioka. So this game is a light dexterity game and you might have seen pictures online. If not, go look it up right now. Um, but the objective of this game is that you're essentially building a Tokyo Highway with basically these wooden uh, discs and not quite popsicle sticks or not quite like the the tongue depressors, um, but it, very similar, right? So they have like, it's just a stick with rounded edges and actually it kind of comes like it's coated with a paint or some something. It's the production value is really nice. It's much more sturdier than your standard popsicle yeah. stick. So um, it's definitely something that uh, if you really wanted to go make yourself, you could, uh, but in essence, you know, when in Rome or in this case, Japan, I saw it and picked up a couple of copies um, and one for me, one for you, which mm-hmm. I, have you, you've played it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've played it, and it's yeah. great. I think I called you our uh, Tokyo Highway pimp because yeah. you pimped out copies of it. <laughs> I did, yes. I was able to pick up three copies for you, myself, and another friend of mine. So, um, But anyways, uh, once again, uh, you're basically creating this Tokyo Highway. Uh, you're placing your cars on the highway um, by connecting these popsicle sticks together from your columns that you're building. And uh, the way that you score points or the way that you score cars is that you have to put these uh, – you have to kind of take your piece of the highway and either go above or below your opponent's highway and so what ends up happening is that you're there's no board there's there's no mat it's just you basically creating this on-ramp and as you start creating these columns the next column that you place with a popsicle stick can either be one less or one more than where you start with so for instance i think the uh the first one you start off is either just one is it one column or two. It's just one. Yeah, one column. Yeah. So you have to go mm-hmm. basically two, right? And then from there, you can go back to one or three for your essentially your third column. And so you're kind of like winding and weaving together as in this two-player game as you're basically eventually over the course of probably six, seven, eight turns, just kind of this massive, like really cool, again, Tokyo Highway. Yeah. Um so I thought that, like I said, going back, the component quality, being able to place these wooden discs, uh, these uh, uh, the popsicle sticks as the roads, uh, these tiny cute little cars, which are kind of like a, like a baby boy blue and a girl pink color uh, with these actual tweezers that they give you, which are somewhat decent as well, too. I thought that was a nice touch. Uh, it, it was. I was surprised to see those tweezers. I was, I was pleasantly surprised with how handy they were in the game actually absolutely yep and and the the thing is too is like the reason why they give them to you is because the cars are relatively small they're maybe about the size of your thumbnail kind of going lengthwise they aren't that big so what ends up happening is when you start getting into the more later end of the turns uh you're having to kind of like if you're able to score you might actually have to try to like stick your fingers or your hands into the road to put some cars on uh, instead they give you these these uh, tweezers which necessarily are n- 
They aren't necessary, but it's helpful. So that it's was helpful, pretty cool. It's helpful for our fat American fingers. Oh, yes. That. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are. Uh, but weird. Okay, so weirdly enough, though, uh, uh, they do not sell the game in the United States. Yeah, they don't. And actually, I remember the first time I saw this. It was available on the Board Game Geek store maybe two years ago. Very small run. And it was available there. And, and that was the first time I saw it. And the, the two things I noticed were the images on how crazy it looked and that it wasn't available uh, anywhere. And those are kind of the two triggers for me where it's like, well, I guess I have to have that game, which is not a healthy reason to get a game. No. Uh, and I didn't. I had no idea how to play it. I didn't know it was dexterity. And to be honest, I didn't know it was dexterity until you sent it to me. <laughs> I just knew. Right? I was like, oh, he's in Tokyo. I'm never going to be in Tokyo anytime soon. So sure, I'll I'll have you pick it up for me. Yeah. But we, I was pleasantly surprised with this game, actually. I, I, I opened it. We read the rules, which were pretty good. Uh, and then my wife and I just played it. And we both actually really, really enjoyed it. It was a close game. She beat me. The The way to win is to get your 10th car out on the on the highway. And she beat me by one car. Oh, no, no. That's not right. We ran out of pieces. Yeah. And she had, she had one more car out than I did. It, it, it was great. I was pleasantly surprised with this game. Yeah. Um, yeah. So either 10 cars or like you're all kind of – you separate the building materials in half – and these columns essentially act as like the timer for the game. So if you don't have any columns to place, you essentially lose the game. Yeah. Um, when so well, I'll get to that in a second. But I also going back to kind of the things that I liked about Tokyo Highway. Uh, let's talk about that table presence. Like there, oh man, we we love games in our test episodes. We've talked a lot about when you have a game out on the table, like how sweet it looks when if you're going to play it out at a convention or even if you're just like playing it at home and you go up to grab some snacks or use the restroom and come back and you're just kind of looking at the state of the board and you're just like holy crap that looks really nice i know that photosynthesis is a game uh that just has that appeal where you look at it and you're just like you you cannot take a bad cell phone picture of photosynthesis same oh, with yeah. tokyo highway tokyo highway is just like the end game state of tokyo highway if it doesn't fall apart is a beautiful looking game. So ours hasn't fallen apart yet. We haven't had a game where that happens. I've heard it happens, but since we're so elegant and meticulous with our hand movements, no, I'm just joking. I have really fat, shaky fingers, so it's a miracle that it never falls down. Yeah. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that the game was light dexterity, and essentially as you're placing these uh, these roads on the different pillars, you, you can't have any part of the road or this popsicle stick essentially kind of jet out away from any part of the uh, the column pillar. So you, you can't have... Um, like I said, and you can't have things overlap or anything like that. There's kind of specific ways of how you have to do that. And there are instances, especially if you're trying to like go under people to be able to score that you might accidentally like, I don't know, hit someone's road off. And and that kind of leads to kind of the one of the more negative things about that game is that if you were to ever do that, and not to say that it happens all that often, but at a late end of the game, I... Uh, depending on how much goes down essentially you kind of have to wipe the game and be like oh well yeah. i lost because what can happen is is that you have to rebuild it and then you're supposed to give some of your columns to the other person but at that point you're just kind of like i don't remember like what cars went where or what cars went on certain roads that fell if so if like multiple them multiple ones fall so you're kind of left being like I just kind of have to scoop and we have to start playing again. Again, the, the game is easy to learn, hard to master, and it's quick to play. Um, but it's kind of a bummer, right? Where you're just oh, like, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. these wipes and restarts, essentially, if you mess up. Um, especially since there are rules saying, like, it isn't Jenga. If it falls down, you lose. But in this game, it's like you try to have to recover. And in this case, you're just like, well, whatever. I'm just going to kind of like leave it as is. And I, I don't know. Maybe you could house rule it that way. That that was kind of a that, it was kind of a bummer. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It was OK. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting. It's not a short game. It's also not a long game. Like it's it's a good length of a game. And so as you invest maybe the 25 to 30 minutes in the game, uh, if that does happen at the end, you're like, well, that was kind of a waste type thing. But at the same time, I think it's so unique. And I love dexterity games. Things like I've invested a lot in Pitch Car and uh, I have, uh, let's see, what else? Dungeon Fighter and... What about Catacombs? Uh, catacombs. I love Catacombs. I love that game. Uh, just that 
I love how people do things differently with dexterity games, and this is a prime example of that. Super excited about that. Indeed. And so, again, that was Tokyo Highway. Okay, so I'm going to go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum for complexity with that game. On when it, we have Tokyo Highway. On the other end, on the other end, we have Feudum. Now, this game is being talked about a lot recently. Uh, it's been going back to it's been sent out to backers from Kickstarter. Uh, it is designed by Mark Swanson. Uh, the artist is Justin Schultz, and it's published by Odd Bird Games. And it did come out this year. Now, this game is pretty polarizing. People either love it or they hate it. I haven't really seen any kind of lukewarm reviews on it. But ultimately what Feudum is, is there's two games going at the same time. There's an area control game in the middle. uh, And what's happening there is affecting what's happening on the outside of the board, which is controlling different guilds. uh, and, and And they're both affecting each other. So you have this this crazy interaction of both of them and there's so much going on uh to the point where it is it's a burden at first it's completely overwhelming uh but but as as much as that kind of terrified me at first that's what intrigued me uh it probably took me about an hour and a half to teach this game the first time but it clicked it clicked the first time it was about three of us uh the second time we played it was it was about four of us and it was a lot shorter to teach at that time maybe only like an hour which i know is still a long time but that's a lot better than an hour and a half uh but after doing that the game just flowed and i was surprised with how well the game flowed after that there was very minimal rule checking uh in the game well w- what it is is uh the main the main part of it is this map on the board and you have your units and there's some light area control and you're still battling each other but that's not really the focus on the game yes it happens but that's not really what the game's about you're choosing actions from a, a hand of cards everyone has the exact same hand of cards uh there's no uh the there are different factions i guess but each faction is the exact same so each player starts the game out exactly the same uh but these actions that you're choosing will manipulate what's happening on the board they'll manipulate what's happening in the guild they'll manipulate what's happening on the map as you're moving around everything you do is from these cards but what's happening around the guilds is depending on your influence on these guilds and the influence you have in these guilds determ is dependent upon uh, your placement on the map and then the guilds interact with each other on the side so you're taking taking some resources from one guild and moving them to another or you're pulling them from one guild into this current guild i know this sounds crazy and complicated but if this sounds at all interesting i highly recommend checking it out we played a, a few times now and what's awesome about this game is, is as you're introducing it there's actually a couple versions of it there's the the basic game and then there's the advanced rules game and that really helps you bring people into the game uh i played with a couple people and and one person uh, is not into euros at all uh but he actually really enjoyed it and was wanting to play again and that was actually the feeling with everyone at the table everyone i've played this with wants to play again and really dive into it are you i mean is this sounding interesting at all to you are you intrigued by this so feudum has yeah like you said feudum has hit uh kickstarter backers and i actually was able to uh find a copy that a that a friend of mine has and I opened it and the reason why I wanted to open it was because I wanted to find the monster mini that came with yeah. the game because oh, yeah. really uh, one thing that actually really does intrigue about the intrigue me about this game or pulls me in is the style of art I think yeah. you look at oh, that yeah. box and I think you actually specifically look at that whatever that monster thing is can you tell me what that monster is? like what oh. what is the point of the freaking striped monster man like what is does it have a name yeah it does and i don't remember off the top of my head uh but they just help in fights it just stays there and it just kind of helps in fights and there are other things i haven't played with all the rules quite yet there's like expansions that bring in other monsters and stuff but i don't remember i'll probably like like 40 minutes from now i'll remember it and i'm just gonna blurt it out with whatever we're talking about and it will just make sense no that'll be great no that'll <laughs> yeah, totally yeah, yeah. sense yeah um so yeah, he we we've talked about Feudum before in the past in in uh, off camera and off audio. Um, mm-hmm. and, and to be quite honest, I I think it is weird because I have heard from multiple people that it's a game where it's like super complicated, but at the same time, 
like you said, it just eventually clicks after a certain point. Like, at what point did it click? Like, was it a turn into the game? Was it, like, after a certain, like, action in terms of being like, okay, I now understand what I need to do. Now it's, start, now it's time to start formulating things. Yeah. Or what? what is it about... What was it about Feudum that it, that did eventually click? And I mean, that even that hour and a half uh, teaching time, the first game at least, even an hour seems a little bit intense. Like, that's oh, pretty crazy. It, it is. I could teach Twilight Imperium in shorter time than yeah. that, right? Right. Uh, it's It was honestly when it clicked was was as I was teaching for the first time towards the end and I was explaining things, it kind of clicked to me, which is a very interesting time for it to click. Like I've read the rules a couple times. I watched their their rules video and everything made sense individually. Yeah. I just had no idea how everything came together. And it finally did and it was it was great. So then once it clicked for me, it was a much more smooth experience in explaining it to everyone else as well. So uh, as long as as well with everyone else, it probably took a round. Like after everyone did all their actions for one round, Mm -hmm. it it made sense. The only thing that didn't make sense was the strategy, right? Like actually how to do well. And that's where the fun comes in. I think I touched on this a tiny bit before about the journey of my board gaming hobby, but I think I'm to the point where uh, I I have this desire, and we we talked about this a tiny bit, but I, I have this desire to play games multiple times now. And, and that outweighs this desire to always be playing new games. Now, at the same time, of course, I'm still playing new games, but I'm I'm really wanting to dive into games uh, individually. And and this is the game that kind of taught me that and taught me the value of doing that. And it's it's been great. I love it. Awesome. What is the what is the objective or like how do you win a game of Feudum? Like, is it victory points? What is it exactly mm. that as a player you're trying to accomplish? Um, is it like, you know, what are you, what are you scoring or what are you trying to do in order to trigger the end game? Yeah. So the way to end is by getting victory points or VPs, but in that game, because it's Feudum and they change everything, the names of everything, they call them veneration points. And that fits in with the theme somehow. I know it's, it's super rich in theme, but it's not, that's not what drug, drug me and drug dragged me into it. Dragged. Yeah, dragged. Yeah, dragged. Yeah. Dragged me into it. Uh, once again, like you were saying, it was that art, that amazing, charming, fun art. Uh, and, and so those points and the way the end triggers is it's played, played over five epochs. And depending on on how quickly you have spread yourselves across the board and upgraded your locations is how quickly the 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 rounds go through. Or, or end, and then at the end of the fifth one, it ends. And there's so much more detail that I, I don't think I can explain in audio. You actually have to like visually see it yeah. to understand it. But it, it is points, and there's a lot of ways to earn points. And there's there's great end game uh, goals if you want to go more towards the end game for your scores, mm-hmm. or get small points here and there, and, and hopefully build up over time. It's oh freak it makes me want to play it right now do you okay do you get like a do you just win the game or do you like become like for instance we played el grande Mm -hmm. what was it on sunday and it's like if you win you become el grande right otherwise like isn't in feudum do you become el feudum or do you You become become... the feudum like do you You become become the monster and that's like it's legacy because now you can only play the monster (laughs) no the they say in the video you become the most venerated in the land nice okay that's cool I yeah. mean that's totally cool because yeah. that, that that art style I I I'd, I'd live there. Oh, totally! It's I'd great, and and there's totally and there's backstory. If you really want to get in the story, there's backstory for everything, and there's a bunch of expansions, and it continues the story, like actually continues the story of what's happening. And I'm, I'm sure it's a great story. I'm sure it's a very lovely story. <laughs> <laughs> And that and that's and that's Feudum by Oddbird Games. By Oddbird Games, that's Oddbird good game. Games. Excellent. I made mention earlier in the podcast that Japan was a trip that I took with my wife, and of course, I dragged her into one of a couple of different board game stores. Uh, in Japan, one of which is Yellow Submarine. So when I was doing my research, I knew that Japan had some board game presence, especially with card games. Collectible card games are insane there. Like, there are just glass cases in glass. Like, there are just complete building floors dedicated to all of the collectible card games that... Um, 
that they have. It, it's truly phenomenal. It's awesome. Um, a lot of them too are actually um, a little bit more adult themed, uh, as mm-hmm. you probably you know anyone that's kind of read a little bit into the culture of Japan. They do tend to, I think, appeal to the male masses. Uh, to a certain degree which is fine i'm not into it but some people really dig it and Mm -hmm. it was just it was just interesting because also the card quality of of their cards is outstanding in fact uh the art the art or the actual like physical quality of the cards uh physical quality of the cards uh yeah like there was actually um if i if i recall correctly uh, the latest printing of magic the gathering uh dominaria set was was printed in japan uh, and that's a lot different from when uh, they were printed earlier. I don't know whether where they were current where they were printed before, but I know that this recent one I've heard had been printed in Japan, and that's why like the card quality and the stock was actually a lot better. Interesting. But you know, say la vie. Um, let's talk about Yellow Submarine. So we stayed uh, in the Shin Okubo uh, ward of Tokyo. So Tokyo, much like New York City has different wards or different areas uh, that I think kind of theme itself to be a certain thing. So Akihabara, oh no. Uh, anyways, there's a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a ward called the Electric City and I it's Akihara, I, Akihabara. Ak, Aki, yo, just Google it, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, anyways, Google Electric City Japan. I'm sorry to anyone who's probably screaming at whatever their, uh, you know, their radio or phone telling me how to per- correctly pronounce that saying. But anyways, that's like totally like where Final Fantasy comes from. Like there's a lot of cool like electronics, uh, different game stores. Super Potato actually, which is a very, very popular game store in Japan, exists in that neighborhood. Really cool. Uh, and we were in the Shinjuku neighborhood, which is a very hip uh, hopping part of town uh, in Japan. And there was, we I put it on Google Maps and we walked like 15 minutes uh, to this alleyway. And it's essentially in Japan, there are a bunch of buildings, the really tall buildings and each floor can kind of be dedicated to a single business. So for instance, if there is a six story tower, there could be potentially six different businesses that exist in that tower, all completely independent, all probably know each other, but aren't affiliated in any way. Mm -hmm. Potentially, I, I, you know, it's just different. Like there's like a nail salon and then there's going to be like, I don't know, like restaurant, restaurant, restaurant. Like it's just, it's insane in terms of like how these people, uh, have been able to kind of take this little part of Japan, part of a building, and just kind of make their own out of it. It's, it's really cool. Anyways, cool. Uh, Yellow Submarine uh, owned kind of like a building, um, which was like probably three or four stories tall, and they actually had a basement. And we went in, and this was small. I mean, we're talking about staircases that could probably easily fit or easily fit just one person and there's people walking up and down so you have to basically turn sideways as you're going up or down because if, if there's somebody wanting to come down as you're going up like you would just basically stare at each other and so naturally you kind of just have to you know dodge to the left and then be able to mm-hmm. get back up so uh down in the basement of yellow submarine in the tokyo neighborhood is again talking about that giant collection of card collectible games in these giant glass uh, glass cases it was really cool to look at and just seeing everything all the magic of the gathering all the Yu-Gi-Oh, all the pokemon all the different you know adult themed ones all the ones with anime it doesn't really matter like whatever you want to look at or find for cards you're going to be able to find it pretty much uh but i don't really play card game much anymore specifically collectible card games it's way too expensive uh so we went up to the second or third floor and we were able to actually visit kind of the main area of yellow submarine which is the board game stuff uh so we looked around and again everything is so compact but there was like so much there right um the in the way back where your big box game so there was a lot of asmodee stuff there was a lot of queen stuff there was a lot of z-man stuff um and that's basically it uh, pretty much like you know asmodee does have a foothold as far as all the different publishers and all the different designer companies that exist out there uh that just have this outreach and so there are you know yellow submarine does purchase some of those big box games. Uh, But you will find more commonly in something like that, 
uh, specifically in the business that we were in, were very many card games. Um, so again, these are card games like uh, Deep Sea Adventure. Do you know that one? Or what is the other one? I think so. Uh, Insider. Do you know what Insider looks like? It's like this really tiny red box and uh, it just like has cards and it's kind of like a social deduction game a little bit. Yes, yes. I've heard of Insider, yes. Yeah. So games like that. The, the And there's just really, really tiny card games that you can play. And I obviously given the amount of space that the average typical Tokyo apartment or home has, like space is a commodity. Like mm-hmm. it, it truly is. So think about trying to set up a game of Feudum in Japan mm. is damn near impossible. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that's just the way it is. So, like, they had Mansions of Madness second edition and stuff like that. Like, that it, it, that's like I I can only imagine what you have to kind of go through in order to specifically in Tokyo. When we went to Hiroshima, there was a yellow submarine there, but there was actually an upstairs area dedicated to playing the games. So much more room there, much more oh, what you would okay. find. But in Tokyo, like, there's no there's no way I, there's no way that I could see somebody setting up a game of Mansions of Madness second edition anywhere. Oh yeah. You know? Uh oh, yeah. you would have to literally have some sort of setup where the table folded into the wall. And I'm not joking either. Like I, I'm seriously like interested on in how you'd be able to get a group of maybe even three people into a Tokyo apartment to play Mansions of Madness. And to those that do, if they're listening, like kudos man. Like that's insane because you definitely appreciate the space that you're given in a country like that. Right. Oh yeah, so it it was interesting. You sent me a couple pictures, and I loved seeing the games that I see on my on my board game shelf shelves, uh, but translated into Japanese. And I just it's it seemed very unifying, right? Like this social glue that binds people together. I don't know. I just thought that was super super interesting seeing that. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's also a section two for role playing, which makes more sense, right? Like there's a, yeah, yeah, like there was actually a really tall bookshelf like display case of all the different role playing games that you could get. And there was a ton of them. They all had great art. Um, And that actually, I think, was probably more predominantly displayed in some of the more big box places. Uh, And it had some really cool, interesting themes that you could kind of go into. And if I knew how to read kanji and really understood Japanese, it'd be really cool to thumb through one of those and see what they were actually all about. But, Mm -hmm. I, you know, couldn't do so. uh, And that's fine. You know, I had my reasons to go there and what have you. So. Um, beyond that, like, again, like you said, totally cool to be able to kind of see your classics, like Citadels was super popular in terms of different stores, uh, Mansions of Madness, as I made mention of, uh, obviously no Twilight Imperium, that just, uh, again, (laughs) when you talk about even trying to get mansions on the table, getting Twilight would be just... Oh It'd yeah, be near impossible. Oh yeah. Um, I'd have to again kind of thumb through some of the different pictures. I actually posted them on Twitter. I, maybe I'll link it as this site goes live. But um, yeah, there was like a whole wall of them that uh, I was able to kind of pick out, and some that were just completely unique. I think just to the e- a- Asian Eastern markets. I think uh, because there was definitely some I don't remember and recognize. But um, in all, yeah, Yellow Submarine was a really awesome place to check out. Uh, if there's anybody listening to this podcast that does like board games and is going to Japan, <laughs> which is a stretch, <laughs> but who knows, maybe one day someone will happen upon this. Uh, yeah. I would recommend going, checking it out, Yellow Submarine. Um, there are also many other smaller stores unfortunately they just weren't within distance of where we were traveling but if you do find yourself in japan for a long period of time there are places outside of the main tokyo city limits that i think do also offer a little bit more space uh and there are a lot of i think other cool places to check out so please do so i maybe will link a few others in the show notes but yeah that was uh yellow submarine in tokyo that's awesome. I wonder what the age group, the the main demographic that plays in Japan. Is it like older guys? Is it high schoolers? I don't know. Good question. Uh, the people that I saw in there were probably in their mid-20s. I'd have to okay. take a guess. Uh, that's, a, that's just a stab in the dark in terms of being able to guess. Like, they weren't our, you know, they weren't our age. They weren't, you know, I think in their kind of like late 
late to late to early 30s they were more so i would say into their specifically with the card games the card games were really popular i think with that 18 to 25 demographic and oh, I, that makes sense. yeah that that's just what it is i think with with what i saw again you're kind of looking at more of like an audience who you know has that expendable income to be able to do it because they aren't cheap either you know that right. that game uh was like 35 dollars tokyo highway tokyo highway is like 35 bucks yeah yeah so um but it, it really I, I think that's comparable to here i could see myself paying that much here for that game i mean yeah it's like a you know it's, it's like a small shoebox i think even smaller than that but there's still a lot of stuff in there and i wouldn't really blink twice or be like oh this is kind of expensive for this kind of game awesome trip <laughs> One game I've been playing recently is Escape from Aliens in Outer Space. Uh, this is designed by Mario Propora, Pietro Riva, Luca, and Luca Francesco Rossi. Uh, it is published by Osprey Games, and it came out originally in 2010. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the Ultimate Edition. I don't know when that actually came out. It was maybe a year or two ago, so it's not that not that far. Is that, also, is that I the, think I sorry. Is that the box that has the really cool artwork to it? Like the yeah. black box, yeah, that that's some sweet box art, man. It, oh, it's so good. It's it's the and there's gloss that's actually part of the art that you can't really see until you actually hold it physically. Also, I'm pretty sure I nailed most of those names. It, it was okay. It was okay. Yeah, it was good. You did those. You did those names justice. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah, that's, that's not uh, that's not easy. That's different. it's not easy with my naive American English. I uh, yeah. Uh, so this is a, a hidden movement game, uh, but it's different from other hidden movement games. So I'm talking about games like Spectre Ops and Letters from Whitechapel and Nuns on the Run and what's the Dracula one? Uh, Fury of Dracula. Fury of Dracula. Is Nuns on the Run a hidden movement game, by the way? I've, I, I don't like... even know what you're talking about. I think there's a game Nuns on the Run. Google it. I could be completely wrong. I've never played it. I just know it's a hidden what, movement game. What about Scott in the Yard? Oh, I never played that. Is that I've heard of it, but I've never played it. Scotland, is that also hidden movement? Yeah, yeah. Scott, Scotland Yard is kind of like the definitive, like hidden movement, and then letters, letters oh. of Whitechapel, and then Fury. Mister Jack. Yeah, Mister Jack. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway, I've only played the following. I've played Letters from Whitechapel, which was a little convoluted for me and a, a bit too much for what I wanted from it, so I got rid of that, and I got Specter Ops. And Specter Ops is a very distilled version of this genre, and I love that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is a all versus all type type of this game. Now there are two teams: there are aliens and there are humans, and everyone has a. Um, binder a small binder of maps which are different ships and no one knows who anyone is so uh, the aliens don't know who the other aliens are and the humans don't know who the other aliens are uh, that the humans don't know who, who the other humans are the humans are trying to get to certain points on the map uh, which are the escape pods and they're trying to escape the ship the aliens are trying to catch the humans and turn them into other aliens uh, and what's fun about that is sometimes the aliens could accidentally kill the other aliens and get them out of the game completely, which is always funny. And it's not the big of a deal because it's not that long of a game. Mm-hmm. Uh, that happened to our, our very first game. I killed my sister-in-law just instantly. I was like, <laughs> I'm there. I attack this position. Only aliens can attack. So if you're attacking, people know that you're then uh, an alien. But what's fun about this is everyone has a a whiteboard eraser, no, a whiteboard marker marking things on the map, on what spaces they're going. And, and everyone's taking a turn. And on their turn, there are multiple uh, types of spaces where if it's one type of space, you don't have to do anything because you're silent. But the bulk of them are the rooms where you make some sort of noise. And so you have to draw a card to see what happens where if you make too much noise or if you're silent, or if you have to, if you do make noise, you have to say what coordinates you are, or some make you tell the truth, some make you lie. So it's just a very interesting blend. It is a party game. It's very accessible. It's really easy to hand out the maps. There's rules in the flip book on the top part and the maps on the bottom part. And so all you have to do is just kind of explain some icons and how things work. And it's 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 tense. It's a very tense game mm-hmm. if you're playing it in the in the correct like 
atmosphere, I guess, where people are just taking it lightly, but then you find people just kind of being quiet and like not sure if they should make a sound or like trying to listen to what other people are doing and, and marking things on their map. Uh, it's a it's a very, very fun game. You've played this before, right? The first time that I played this game, I played it with max people. And unfortunately, it was really, really difficult to get into. And I, I think that's just because it was, I think, everybody's first time playing Escape from the Aliens in Outer Space. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, and so everybody was kind of like, you'd be... Uh, have like you said you'd be playing playing the different cards and whatever and announcing coordinates and then you know you'd have the silence and and then you'd have somebody really like you know just you'd be quiet and then they'd be like what am i supposed to do again <laughs> and, and you're just like god damn it like seriously <laughs> it's uh, su- it, it, like it sucks it like it took me out of it uh, don't get me wrong like i would love to play this a game again but i want the player count to be at a much more manageable size um five me, six i was yeah. gonna make i was gonna say like five or six people um and and again the group that i played it with were mu- they weren't uh they they had played their share but when it came to kind of the more complicated hobby board games like i i admit it's not the easiest to pick up and you know mm-hmm. great for them for being able to come out and try new stuff but sometimes the etiquette of being just kind of shouting that stuff out uh, just kind of put me off and oh, to yeah. me that is what skewed escape from being something that i can look at and be and, and seeing on paper and being like oh that's a really awesome hidden movement game to being just like ah like these people i played it with kind of bummed me out on it and it wasn't something that i was too immediately interested in wanting to play again uh but again i would say now being able to kind of like get that out of my system i'm very much interested in wanting to try this game again and, you know, that's interesting. I, I haven't played this yet with my game group who are all, like, you know, into games, right? So I wonder how much of a different experience it would be with that where people are, like, legit taking it seriously and trying to win. It's, it's great. And and one thing I love about this game is that as the humans, um, if the aliens win, all the aliens win. But if a human wins, humans can uh, – some humans can win and some humans can lose. As a human, you win by leaving the in an escape pod, but sometimes the escape pods don't work. And once someone takes an escape pod, no one else can take that escape right. pod. And right. so it creates this great tension uh, about it. Now, the the first time we played, uh, our markers were terrible, like the ones that came in the game. It was the same ones that come in uh, uh, Captain Sonar, if you've seen those. But it's the same style, but it was just terrible. But my, uh, my sister-in-law brought out these, like, dry erase markers that she's really proud of i was like why why do you know the brand name of your dry erase markers uh but then i used them i was like oh that's why you know the brand name of your dry erase markers they were amazing uh it was the board dudes i don't know who they are but that sounds really familiar that does sound familiar okay there's there's a free plug for them for the 10 people who who hear this episode (laughs) what a great what a great (laughs) name for like magic markers right? I, the I know, board I know. Dudes, like the board seriously dudes. they were just like they just sound like they were high and like what do we want to call our whiteboard company <laughs> they board were dudes <laughs> they were high on marker fumes yeah that, like, right that's what it was oh it's my so God. it's beautiful it's beautiful uh, it's funny. anyway awesome game i recommend it it's very accessible uh it's not an expensive game it's awesome production it's, it's not a lot of components very easy to pick up uh, I did. I did actually sleeve the cards in this game. I'm not much of a sleever these days. I used to be. That's another story for another time. Uh, but but I do find myself sometimes because the the card quality is really interesting. It like it feels amazing. They put this really awesome finish on it, but I feel like they scuff. Like these cards actually scuff, which is the opposite of what you want for a hidden movement game where you want to know the what card what. Uh, or don't want to know what the cards are by looking on the back of them. So we did end up sleeving it. But overall, like awesome, awesome production quality, great art, just fun, this fun experience overall. That's Escape from Aliens in Outer Space, the Ultimate Edition, available in multiple places online. <laughs> Amazon, which is where at I bought your, it. At your fligis. <laughs> at your fligis. At your fligis. Go say hi to your local fligis. <laughs> Uh, uh, the last game that I want to be able to talk about today is keeping on the Japan theme, just because again, recently coming back and being really uh, intrigued and motivated by being in that country and coming back. Uh, 
got me to play a game that I've had on the shelf for a very, very long time. Sorry, which... I have to stop you. It's Behemoth. The monster in Feudum is called Behemoth. Yes! <laughs> I got so it! awesome. Nice. It is probably... You should check. Check the timestamp. Okay, hold on. Timestamp is... Well, 4910 on this, but it'll be different when I after I edit it down. But that's... Oh, I apologize for just interrupting your flow there, but I got it. No, it's awesome. I appreciate it. Leave this in. Like I, I that, will. I You will. have to leave it in. I will. It doesn't matter. Anyways, let's get back. The, okay, no, that, now I'm totally like that's awesome Uh, because i completely forgot about it (laughs) and then when and then when you said like we would know i totally knew what you're talking about it yeah good that is that is excellent okay that was a rush all right tell me about yokohama 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 uh keeping on that japanese theme uh is a game published by tasty minstrel games they re they did a kickstarter for it i want to say a couple years ago the designer is haisashi hayashi and it's a worker placement type of game. Um, and this game is a game about being a merchant in the town of Yokohama. It's a really, it's a big for exports and imports for different goods in Japan. And in this game, you play as a merchant. And the objective is for you to get enough points to be able to become the most famous merchant of Yokohama. So how do you do that? Uh, to do that... At the beginning of the game, you're given a series of different assistants, which are just cubes. Uh, I got the pleb version of Yokohama very sadly. I had the op- I had the ability to purchase actually outside of the Kickstarter the deluxified version for like eighty bucks, and I passed on yeah. it. And yeah. I, after playing Yokohama, I was like dang it i really wish i would have picked up the deluxified version at that price but again i'm being strong i'm trying not to just i was gonna buy it literally for the components like i couldn't see myself actually being like okay 80 bucks for like a fancy box and components Mm -hmm. i digress uh going back again at the start of the game you're given kind of this series of like a little board and you have these assistants and you have like a bunch of them like eight to start off with and maybe like an additional 12 to 16 to obtain. Uh, You have uh, like a trading store and then um, you have shops and then you have trading shops as well um, alongside all these different types of goods that you can sell or buy um, or obtain throughout the, throughout the game. Uh, The, the goods are silk, fish, brick, um, and, silk (laughs) i said silk twice um i'm gonna figure it out and i'm probably gonna scream it again 15 minutes later into this thing it'd be be great there's gonna be one more t t is the one that you you have to get but the question is is there silk yes okay uh silk silk is confirmed in this game so what what's really cool about this game is first well you have to set it up and they have the most giant scoreboard i've ever seen in a game of all time like that that I swear, like, do uh, you know, like, the player board of Vast, the Crystal mm-hmm. Caverns? Like, take that, like, that's a good reference point. Like, that's a pretty big player or role sheet that you take, and it's, like, on this nice cardboard. Uh, I would say that it's, like, a tad bit bigger than that. So you plop oh, wow. that in the middle of the table, and then you have, like, five scoring tracks, right, that you place next to it, depending on how many players you play with. And then underneath all of that, you have to kind of create this upside-down pyramid of all the different areas that you can visit to. Um and what you do every turn during the game is you have – there's three phases as part of your turn. But really the only phase that matters is the second part of the phase, which is your main phase, which kind of makes sense and doesn't make sense. But I'll talk about it here in a second. Anyways, what you do is you have to place your assistance on the board of areas that exist. So, like, these can be, like – um different shops where you can get all the different materials at so you can kind of go to like the silk store you can go uh to mine you can go uh, get your fish what have you and you place your assistants either three uh you can place three assistants one in each area or you can place two assistants on one area and you have a president so That's the next phase, part of the step, is you have this president, which is a pawn, and you can place that uh, either from your hand, which isn't, which is kind of weird, um, because it technically doesn't, it's not like a deck of cards where it's in your hand, but it's kind of in front of you, but it's outside of this player board. Regardless, you take this pawn, you can move it to anywhere uh, on the map, and then once it's on the map, in future turns, you can kind of move it adjacent, 
uh, just one phase or as many as the assistants will allow you to. So there's kind of like you're creating like a trail. So you, like if you have three different assistants in three different areas, you can move to one of the different uh, like two others because you can't be on the same area for more than one turn. It's very complicated uh, how I'm describing this. But alas, what you're kind of doing is you're getting your you're you're kind of creating a trail for your president to essentially go and take these actions on being able to pick up all these different goods that you'll eventually use to complete orders or to complete achievements or to be able to like go to the church and be like hey I want to donate these goods and gain faith and be able to be put onto the score track or whatever um, those sort of things. And it's really cool because then as these two or three other players, it's a two to four player game and we played a three player game. So as the other two players start kind of taking their areas, you start to see like that this big giant upside down pyramid is actually very uh, consolidated and very isolated because you start finding out that the different types of actions you want to do are either being populated by your opponents or even is being sat on by the president. So what's happening is, is that if you ever move through an area with an opponent's president, you have to pay them a yen, which is the kind of coin currency throughout the game in order for you to be able to like uh, purchase shops or a trading area or what have you. And um, every single shop or pawn or assistant or president, what have you, is equal to a power level. So it's usually one point for anything that exists that you put on anything. And every single area has a power level one to five and five is the max power level. So if you're able to get like, like let's say for instance, three assistants and your president on one area, that's a total of four power. And you could do the level four power action on that area. So instance, if you wanted to get fish and you create a level four power action, you get like four fish, right? Uh, from that, you can also then build buildings. Uh, so you can build that with whatever is available to you and you can put that there and that gives you like a permanent uh, uh, strength or power to that specific area of all time. So there's like this pathway thing with some area control in terms of the different areas that you're in. It's so completely modular too because each card and each tile can be different. And so there's like literally an infinite amount of combinations wow. of Yokohama that can be played. So like uh, the game of Yokohama I played was probably completely unique and probably you'll never ever play it in your version like ever I would say in terms of Man. like all the different combinations because each of the each how this triangle is made is each different area is like its own cardboard piece and so it can be in this like infinite amount of different combinations it's it's insanity um it and you want to play it though it's wow, a, that it sounds so it's, cool it's 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 a game where you look, we talk about, again, I'm going to talk about table presence. I think that's one of the most important things to me is like I go to a convention or if I'm like going into a game area and I'm looking at a table, I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Here's the thing. Yokohama has a very intimidating table presence and it also doesn't look that great either in terms of just like what it has going on for it. Like it's huge. That's what it has going on for it. But yeah. when you look at everything, it's like, Jesus, what is happening here? As you're playing it, like it makes complete sense because you start seeing like how I want to create these paths with my assistants to be able to get my president to be able to mine stuff. And then I want to be able to go up here and get some fish. Oh, and then I want to be able to go to the harbor and be able to like trade some of my export goods to be able to fill this order to like it just it just makes sense. Like it it's really really like streamlined system but when you're looking at it as just a viewer you're looking at this and you're like there's no way i ever want to play a game like this see and it's interesting you say that because that's actually what turned me off from the kickstarter that was what like three years ago maybe uh i remember seeing that i was just like this looks crazy like there's no way i would be able to like understand this now there's a difference between well that's a different type of table presence if you compare that with like the table presence of rising sun or something like that mm -hmm. where that table presence is just there because of the miniatures but that has a table presence uh on yokohama where it's just this complexity that isn't necessarily complexity right it just looks like it's like it's complex uh actually that almost reminds me of feast for odin where you have like yeah. over 60 actions for a, a worker yes. placement game right now in the end, it, they are grouped together, and they're all just like different versions of specific actions. I've actually never played it. I've just kind of done research because mm -hmm. it looks very interesting uh, to me. But but it's that idea of of is that table presence going to turn people away, or is it going to invite people into it? And I think that's totally dependent upon the person mm -hmm. actually like looking at the game themselves. Right. 
And I think if it wasn't for my trip to Japan, like Yokohama would have probably sat longer than it did and probably would have seen the cell pile. So it was kind of serendipitous that, you know, go to Japan, come back and being like, oh, I traveled by Yokohama. Oh, I have a game called Yokohama. Oh, I should actually probably use the big giant card, not cardboard, the wooden component set that I got for Mm -hmm. a deluxified version of the game that I don't own. (laughs) So like for the, I actually ended up purchasing like extra bits for it. And then because I like I I had been like going to Top Shelf, what is it, Top Shelf Gamer, Top Shelf yeah. Geek, and mm-hmm. I I literally like three times looked at it and be like, oh, I should really get those. And then I'm like, oh, for a full playset, I need like to pay a hundred bucks, and I'm like, oh, mm, man. nah, that's okay. So I found some from Meeple Reality or Meeple uh-huh. Source, and I was able to get a playset for like 50 bucks which is kind of still a little bit insane but actually looking at them they actually seem to be what the deluxified components for the materials would be so that was actually really neat oh that's interesting yeah they looked really they looked very similar um so that the only thing is i'm missing the buildings so i might try if i'm feeling up for it i might actually try to seek those out or at least find equivalents because all it is is just like can i find wooden houses that are small enough and i'm pretty confident i probably could so um and yeah talking again about streamlining with this game like all of your all of your turns go by really really quick so again um you know you have your assistants you have your president uh you take the action if it's a five level action you can do some fancy stuff and you can build and then all of the assistants that are on the area that you did the action on actually get brought back to your hand and so then at that point, what ends up having to happen is then you kind of have to other create this trail again. Um, or if you find yourself stuck, which I had to do one time, you can actually put yourself out of the board and be able to kind of come back in wherever you want, but you lose your entire turn. So really, in essence, like every single turn is going to go by like really, really quick, which is awesome. Um, but at the same time, though, like the game we started with our game group last Tuesday at probably around like 7.30, 7.45, we were maybe a little past halfway at about 10 hours. Holy not, not, ten, ten, not at 10 right, right, right. p.m. At 10. Um, it, it, like there there was definitely an end to this, you know, an end to the game, but it was definitely probably another hour, hour and a half out. Um and, and that kind of sucks. Like the uh, the length of the game uh, kind of bummed me out a little bit because you the the time to get your engine rolling is a, is a little bit slow. And that just could be because it was you know our first game or whatever. But um, I just kind of got that sense where it's just like oh I could probably like see those three three and a half hours you know probably fly oh, yeah. by relatively quickly. So well, and what's interesting with a game length like that, it all depends on the game, right? Like. Our TI4 games clock in at about four hours, and we're playing, or three to four hours, and we're playing with three or four people, right? And so, if a game is about that same length, like honestly, Feudum can easily go that long. Yeah. And it's, and honestly, it's fine. I wouldn't want a game of Escape, the Aliens in Outer, gosh, what is that name? This Escape from the Aliens in Outer Space to go that long, right? It's totally dependent on the game. So, if the game uh, is worth playing that long, if it, if it, if the value is worth that much time, that's fine. Yeah. If you plan for it. If it's a surprise, like, surprise, we're here for four hours. Yeah, exactly. That's story. Yep. And so uh, to kind of uh, to kind of end this as well, too, some of the tokens, like, there's foreign agents as well, which aren't super imperative, but as you start collecting orders and different things, like, you'll have different agents on them. And if you collect pairs of them, you can get uh, a token that's, like, really, really small. It's, like, I don't know, maybe half an inch by half an inch. It's, like, a weirdly small token for what it actually does, and it allows you to actually do an action on an area uh, without having your president there. So it's mm-hmm. it's pretty influential, but it's, like, this tiny thing about the size of a fingernail that you have to kind of, like, pick up and flip over. That's a one-time use thing. And it's just, like, I could see it being a tad bit bigger, but... Uh, really nitpicky thing doesn't really matter it just there was like with the with how big the board was and then you just have this kind of important piece with how small it was it was kind of a juxtapose of like oh wow that's kind of awkward and weird like why don't you just make this thing a little bit bigger and have a little bit more presence but 
whatever. So again, it has that bad table presence. It looks way too confusing. Maybe a little bit too long. You know, these are honestly very small nitpicks that just kind of came up throughout my thing and being like, okay, well, this isn't the most like perfect game, but in a whole, like as I'm playing this, it definitely was something that I wanted to be like, I really want to be able to bring this out again and play it again at least a few more times before potentially being like, hey, you know, there really isn't a need for this in my collection anymore, ready to take it out. Uh, but I, I'm not ready to get rid of it. I, this is something that I'll definitely keep in play for some time. Uh, how would how would it play at two, two players? Uh, good. I think uh, yeah. the 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 pyramid triangle uh, shrinks. Oh, okay. okay. And there are some extra available options within the scoring tracks, which also determine whether or not the game ends. So it's like if certain orders get completed enough times, they can't fill the track. Or if a track is filled with a certain amount of people on it, that's what triggers the end game. So uh, there is definite scaling for two players, I would say. And I think it would be okay. I think it'd be that's fine. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That's Yokohama by TMG. Awesome. That sounds great. So, you know, again, we are, uh, you know, starting this podcast now knowing each other for approximately six to eight hours, honestly, like in terms of the amount of time that we've been talking, this is probably heading upwards to a full workday worth of friendship. That's exciting. And I think I want to use this part of the podcast. We want to use this part of the podcast, much like how you are probably screaming at your cell phone or auditory device that you're listening on to be like, hey. What uh? What do these guys? What what do, what do these guys think about things? Like, what do we want to learn about each other? Mm-hmm. Don't mm-hmm. you think that's appropriate? Oh yeah, that's great. All I right, I'm gonna ask you a really personal question. A really, I, I'm really going to just dig in here. Dig, dig. And we're just gonna we're just gonna probably unearth some skeletons. <laughs> if I start crying, is that okay? Yeah, I think that's totally okay. fine. You're in, within a safe space. Uh, okay, good. That it also includes all of iTunes. <laughs> I'm okay uh, with that. That they can find. Um, oh, no, well, no. So this question is going to be board game related, and it's something that hopefully uh, will stand out. But uh, throughout your board gaming career, pick one board game or pick one board game that has your favorite box art of all time. One board game. Is there a f- follow-up question to this? No. No. Okay, okay, okay. And I just like realized it might be slight, a slight bit anticlimactic being like how we were going to get all personal. I'm like, what's your favorite box cover <laughs> art? Right? I, I thought I, first I thought it would be a question like, what game reminds you of your childhood and how you never really were a, had a fulfilled relationship with your parents? No, <laughs> yeah, Dude, that is my question. Go, I thought go that was for it. Question. Okay, uh, box art. Let's see. Oh, there's some really great box art. And I'm scanning my closet right now. I, I am sitting in my game room thinking, and uh, I'm going to go with, I know Feudum seemed really obvious, but I'm going to go with a very another obvious answer, and I'll, I'll explain why. But I'm going to have to go with Scythe. So mm. I know, I know. This it's is like, really, this is, this is tasty. I like this. I know. So I remember seeing Scythe for the first time when it entered Kickstarter in, jeez, what was that? It was like 2016. I think it was a long time ago. And and I just saw that, and I just instantly connected with that world. Uh, and I, I instantly was like grabbed by it, and it was just like this amazing experience of like, I want to, I want to play whatever is in that box. I have no idea what's in that box, but I know I want to play it. Now, games I'd played previously by Stonemeyer Games was like Euphoria. Euphoria. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think <laughs> that's, that's really all. it. Like, honestly, I think that's the only game I played. Uh, and so then I, I just got side. I, and now, to, to be honest, I. I did love Euphoria. I think it's a great game. Uh, but then I got Scythe, and then I just I, I just had this experience. And every time I play it, every time I bring it out with people, and it's been probably one of my most played games in my whole collection, just between all the game groups and friends that I force it on and they want to play it again, everyone just always talks about the art and, and how uh, illuminating it is and, and how it makes them feel, how, uh, how much they love the art in the game. And then he came up with the legendary box which is completely different artwork for it so that that's the long answer for for best art cover and i know it's a very like well duh of course it's a great box art 
uh, because that's kind of what it was based on, right? I mean, he wanted to make a game based on the world, like based on the art of Jacob Brzezowski. Like that is why the game was made was because of the art. And I think that is key to great board game art. What do you think of the controversy behind it? So I think now this is coming from a perspective of a graphic designer. Now the the controversy uh, being that there was a lot of uh, heavy inspiration slash tracing from other pieces of artwork. Uh, and I, I don't know everything. And now I'm going to say allegedly because I don't want to be... It caught in anything allegedly. Well, the, it was interesting because I think for a day this was like some hot news, and then yeah. it died really quickly. And maybe it's still yeah. going on in BGG. Uh, I don't really participate yeah, don't in those forums too much, but I know there was a lot of uh, board gaming industry industry people kind of weighing in on it. And then mm-hmm. I didn't hear anything after that yeah. day. So, so I mean, he came out and he said, you know, it. it it wasn't something he was proud of and he was at like a very stressful time, but here's the thing like, okay, yes, some, there are some, like some things he took directly from something, but he's still a very skilled dude, right? You still see the stuff he adds to it. You still see all of this. And so I get that. It's not, it definitely wasn't handled ideally and, and he should have handled it completely differently or managed time better. And I'm just saying this, uh, I'm just, I'd, you know, of course, I don't know the whole situation. This is just me. But I know as like a graphic designer, there's times where I just like I take an idea that I see somewhere else and I adapt it to what I'm working on. And it's, you know, I'm borrowing it or that's just kind of how things go sometimes. It's very it's not a very common experience where I'm I'm doing something completely original. Right. Everything kind of influences other things. Uh, but to the, the degree or the level of of influence or inspiration that you take, that's where it kind of gets that gray area. And, you know, I, did he do it perfectly? Did he, did he do it justice or did he cite things as much as he should have? No, no, of course not. But I think he's learned and, and I think he's changed and I still love his artwork. It's not like I'm going to go burn my copy of Scythe. I still love, I still love it. I'm still going to get the new expansion when it comes out. I don't, I think people like to, find drama in times at times uh and this isn't just one where i just i don't care enough to to be passionate about it personally yeah it's interesting because again it doesn't make scythe a bad game right right it doesn't i'm because i'm still very intrigued by the theme of that world and it is really awesome and it's really unfortunate that uh that type of evidence did surface and appear it's maybe more so problematic for him at an industry standpoint in terms of if anyone decides to ever work with him again, you know? Right. Oh, right. Right. Like I, I totally think he kind of burned that bridge. Now it's not like he was originally in board games. He was kind of brought into that world, but he's, there was a Kickstarter for uh, an RTS game based on Scythe. Right. right? Not on Scythe. I'm sorry. On the, on that same world. Yeah. There was a, um, the guy who made, Oh man, he was making YouTube videos, but he was like a big name director that he did like other movies. Oh my gosh, what was it? Anyway, he made a short based on a painting of Jacob Brzezowski. Really? Uh, and, hmm. and I wish I knew his name. He did, uh, what's the movie with the the robots? District 9 is that guy. Oh yeah, that was, uh, I know it's on the tip of my tongue. I don't know. Let's go to next oh. episode and then we'll scream it okay. out in the middle of something. And we'll figure yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we'll just scream it. Yes, we'll scream it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly who you're talking about, though. So mm-hmm. we're we're on the same wavelength. We just don't oh, know yeah. what that guy's name is. Yeah, so that's really cool. Scythe is a good pick. I think uh, it's very iconic. I, I, at yeah. this point, I can safely say that that box art in that game is, is pretty pretty iconic. And I'm not necessarily going to look at it and be like, but it's just right. It's I know. just like it's it's a bummer, and but I'm still interested in playing Scythe and stuff, and that doesn't take that away from it. So, you have played it, right, or have not played? Yeah, it? Yeah, I played Scythe a handful of times. I, I okay, like the okay, game. Yeah. I'm not good at it, but I like the game. Oh, me neither. Oh, I'm not good at any game I play. Nope, I'm not. I'm <laughs> actually really surprised that I scored eight points in Twilight Imperium Four. <laughs> that's that's not bad. Yeah, I think that's I think that's great. Seriously, yeah. So I'm 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 happy with that. I lost, and I actually came like one turn away from scoring, and and my friend just had played better, and that's totally cool. So yeah, yep, that's cool. Um, what's your? I mean, just off the top of your head, what's your pick? You think for best board game art? 
uh, in terms of like the same like box art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the reason why I asked you this question, um, and I haven't. Oh wow! For some reason, I can't believe why I forgot that. Okay, so I messaged you about um, so Greenbrier Games uh, is a publishing company that um, published the game Vengeance. Oh yeah. Okay. So if you haven't oh, seen that's the- great box art. Yeah, right? That game does really like it it reminds me of an action movie that was actually done um where it just has like with this one guy running into like a bunch of different people with like a golf club and it's just like the colors that are being used and the way that space is being used cuz like it's it, there's a lot of empty space but for whatever reason like that box art just completely draws me in and gives you like that killville uh kill uh bill vibe to it and just like this really like intense hardcore um like experience like when you open up the box i'm like yeah i'm gonna really feel like this action hero and be able to kind of play through this whole scenario um i am thinking about picking it up actually again like that game gravity like that game much like scythe to you like to me that looking at that box art was like i really want to check this game out like just on on a on a front like reading reading the box cover as a i don't know the cover like that's what draws mm-hmm. me in that's really cool but oh, yeah. uh as far as art in total another green buyer game that i backed which i actually use as rotating background on my computer at work is grim slingers oh i haven't heard of that okay you should go look it up um grim slingers is this game that has like the best art i've ever seen in my entire life like truly like this this guy uh that does it and again his name escapes me we are terrible at this <laughs> this is why when you do stuff on uh very much um ad hoc that like it it uh bring it it's, it's on google like you're probably looking at it right now i saw you click it. i am okay i am please let me know who, oh, i follow boy. him on twitter he like retweeted my stuff because uh, i went into the kickstarter and I was able to find some like full art, like digital stuff that he released as part of the Kickstarter stuff. And like I had, I've yet to change it from my back. Like it's just, he does some great digital, like digital artwork. Oh yeah, dude, it looks so uh, good. It says one of the mechanisms is rock paper scissors. Yep, <laughs> it is. So the so I won't get too much into the gameplay behind Grim Slingers, uh. but it uses like the different elements like wind earth fire uh captain Planet oh okay kind of stuff. I see. Yeah, yeah and what it does is it kind of all combats each other like you're either like the cards that you play um kind of like either you're weak against it or you're strong against it that sort of thing and that plays out and it's also uses like a really kind of miniature version of blackjack so it's interesting in terms of like all the things that they borrow from like these really simplistic card games and he kind of makes it into like this like parlor game but there's like a lot of awesome backstory behind it and the artwork like it's top notch the game isn't all that i think interesting Mm -hmm. but i mean Mm -hmm. oh steven gibson that's his name isn't it oh uh, that's his name it's it's steven gibson i'm i'm confident that that's who the artist like he did the art i think he also did the game as well like this, Stephen gibson yeah yeah this guy is very talented when it comes to this kind of stuff uh and so it's impressive for him to be able to like pretty much do all that artwork plus be able to kind of develop the game behind it and i i must say like hands down that as a whole package i think is probably some of my favorite board game art of all time uh your answer is way better than my answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's fine. It's fine. I'm happy with my answer. Yeah, it's just totally, totally, it's fine. Totally softball answer. That's totally okay, though. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm the most boring gamer you've ever met. You're fine. That's my favorite game is Monopoly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> take that back immediately, right take, now. Take take that. I take it back. It's Monopoly. Uh, Star Wars Monopoly. Uh, okay, oh, no. so I've and so I have a question for you. Yes. This is a, a, a bit deeper. Um, what do you think is your end goal for for playing games? Why, on a deeper level, do you think you play board games? Mm. Uh, I, I've got theories, but I want to I hear yours. Yeah. So the reason why, or 
I don't have an end game when it comes to board games. Really, what it comes down to is um, I'm hanging out and I'm socializing and I'm having fun, right? It's not about winning for me. There's a lot of friends I have that play to win and they will sit there and they'll think of the most optimal move and they'll Mm -hmm. take some time and make that move. And a lot of the times they'll win and that's totally cool. But for me... Being part of the cult of the new, you know, usually trying out games for the first time and kind of moving on to something else for the first time, I'm getting people around me to also participate in that with me. And we're able to catch up, we're able to play this game together. And to me, that is what makes this hobby for me so entertaining uh, and so fun to participate in. And I really kind of also, um, make it it's like you're playing interactive art really yeah ooh, I you're like playing that. with interactive art like the board the board game cover is like that painting that draws you in and then i don't know think of like mona lisa the board game what if you could just pop the top off of mona lisa the board game and it's just like weird ass euro or something like that <laughs> i don't know but to me that's what is really cool about um board games is because not yeah. only does so much care and thought go into making some really cool art but that same level of thought and care if not deeper which can or cannot you know it probably can be argued right but like the mechanics and the fine tuning and the amount of play testing and the amount of hours that designers and designer like a designer or designers put towards it even game producers making sure like like think of a a, what is it vital lacerda right is that yeah yeah yeah. like look at a like the gallerist for instance like that game is literally oh, yeah. the the box cover for that game for the gallerist is literally uh like it's uh it's like um where you have the different uh, what is it the the pains of paintings the yeah it's like it's like uh it's like high art it's like i'm staring at the side though i don't see the front of it on my shelf it's it's like yeah, you're I unwrapping you're like someone had shipped all these pieces of art to you and so like there's like this cardboard um you know color to or cardboard this like uh, canvases canvases thank you uh and yeah. you're just kind of ripping off like the cover to it as if like somebody sent it to you and it just kind of reveals like this you know all these canvases to you and then you get in there and then you look at like this really cool like modern like bird's eye view of like all the different museums that you could go to and like how all the components are and even looking at the organizers that keeps it all in like it all looks so beautiful there's like every single aspect to this game from the cover to opening it up to playing it and then the fun part of pointing it out back (laughs) you'd like it's honestly there's like this organizational like high that i get when i'm able to like you know there's like people like do yoga Man, if I sit in front of a TV and start sleeping for three hours, like, you cannot, like, piss me off. Like, oh, easy. I'm, like, straight up, like, the most zen person you'll ever find. <laughs> right? And I love that. It's it's so it's so true. I mean, I feel like a big part of this life is relationships and and being with each other and, and just enjoying that time with each other. And board games, of course, is not the only medium to do that, but is such a great interactive medium to do that. And, and you just... If you get a good game, a good game that brings people together and, and you just have a good time... Oh, I love that answer. I think that's great. I agree wholeheartedly. Indeed. It's... And you know what's interesting? I... I've been one at times where I'll invite people over for a game and the focus is on the game and it's not on the social aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And and that backfires so easily because it all depends on the on the group you're playing with, right? If I'm just having friends and family over and we're playing a game, that's to be a social situation. Now, if it's a game night, it's still a social situation, but the focus is more on the game. And so you have to kind of find that balance sometimes. But still, hanging out with a bunch of people, just having a good time creating those bonds it's great yeah absolutely um yeah i mean i have lasting friendships um with people and those people that i play with also kind of off on the side be like hey i'm also doing like a a one-time thing with this game with these group of people like are you interested in coming like the whole board game community in a whole has been very welcoming and just Mm -hmm. a, a great community to be a part of and that's oh, kind yeah. of why I wanted to make 2018 a year for me to be able to um, 
express that like really contribute back and be able to be like hey here's what i've been playing and maybe that also intrigues someone to bring out a copy of yokohama or um you know brings out a copy of escape right like the, the yeah. that's the that's the whole goal is just being able to help expand and, and share these great and interesting stories uh and really pay appreciation to the hardworking people artists designers everybody um with these games it sounds kind of oh, cheesy yeah. but it, it's honestly the truth for me it's, it's so it's, true it's honestly the truth so yeah i love it that's great speaking of i think we kind of rocked this first episode what do you think boom slam boom. slam dunk james harden basketball words <laughs> sports ball sports ball <laughs> touchdown to win the world series yeah overall though i really appreciate uh those who are listening to this uh those few that will that will be with us at the beginning uh this is a fun project for us to to do and and hope to stick with it and it'll be really interesting to see where it goes if it picks up at all if it's listened by anyone overall the true magic is getting to know you ryan oh my god don't make me tear up now i'm staring to my camera (laughs) and just wink slowly hello dink and thanks so much for listening. Intro and outro music was See Do Play by Fantastic Plastic Machine. Follow us on social media at Rolling Doubles PC. Join us next time for exciting board game discussion and equally exciting nose whistles on Rolling Doubles Podcast. Oh,